Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liz C. Medvedow, Executive Director of the Rappaport Center. I'm really delighted to have you all here today for this program on race and wrongful convictions. It is a very special program with an amazing panel. I am only introducing our moderator, Professor Sharon Beckman, and giving her the honor and privilege of introducing everybody else. So, Professor Sharon Beckman was the founding director of the BC Innocence Program. She serves on the SJC Standing Committee on Eyewitness Identification, the Massachusetts Convicted and Integrity Working Group, the Innocence Network's Ethics and Best Practice Committee, and the Criminal Justice Act Screening Panel for the First Circuit Court of Appeals. She has been a BC law for slightly more than 25 years. She's the recipient of numerous awards. She is both a clinical professor and has been a doctrinal professor. She's taught criminal law, criminal procedure, constitutional law, and more. She went to Harvard College and the University of Michigan Law School, where she was editor of the Law Review. She clerked notably cause for Sandra J. O'Connor in the United States Supreme Court. I personally think that is incredibly cool. I just <laughs> want to say. And for Judge Frank Coffin here in the First Circuit Court of Appeals. She, prior to being at BC Law, was what I would call, quote unquote, a real lawyer, a practicing <laughs> lawyer in Chicago and Boston for several years. She is also notably the first New England woman, another very cool piece of information, to, sw to swim across the English Channel. Wow. She was ranked, wait, hold your, hold this, ranked first in the country and third in the world for women marathon swimmers. <laughs> She's an amazing lawyer. She has done amazing work working to help people get out of prison, get exonerated. She is passionate. She is committed. She is really dedicated. And she's done all these cool things. So we are truly honored that she has agreed to moderate the panel. I would be remiss in my job as executive director of the Rappaport Center to turn this over without telling you about our program that is coming up next, October 18th. We are doing a program on transgender rights, state and national developments. We have John Ward, the founder of Black, the Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders as our moderator. We have incredible panelists who will be here. Casey Pick from the Trevor Project, Karen Greensmith, who is about to become director of policy at the Transgender Law Center. And oh my goodness, Abby, who's the third? Um, oh, you have, uh, oh, and Shackley Brooks, I'm sorry, Shackley Brooks.
Um, and that is a program that over the years has about 100 students and students in federal students in Chicago, Whitmore, and then Jacobs in Chicago. Boston College Business Program is really um, proud of students in the district who are the co sponsors of the Rocky Program Support Center for Law and Public Policy. As is part of our celebration of the 10th International Wrongful Conviction Day. Wrongful Conviction Day is a day where Innocence Network organizations, of which the Boston College Program, Innocence Program is one, all around the world um, come together to educate about the problem of wrongful convictions and the underlying causes, to celebrate the courage and survivorship of the women and men who survived wrongful conviction um, and fought to um, prove their innocence and to be exonerated. Um, and their family members um, also as well. And um, also to uh, focus on and have a conversation about moving forward, what can we all do, whether lawyers or not lawyers, to um, uh, remedy wrongful convictions and try to prevent them in the future. I'm gonna start with a number, 3,385. That's the number of people we know about in the United States who have been exonerated after having been wrongfully convicted of crimes they didn't commit. Collectively, they served almost 30,000 years in prison for these crimes that they did not commit. We know this because of the data collected by the National Registry of Exonerations, and you'll hear more from its founder and lead researcher shortly. Empirical research about these wrongful convictions has proven that they're not anecdotal, that there are underlying patterns that recur in these cases and contribute to causing wrongful convictions. They include practices such as incentivized false accusations, where a witness receives an award in exchange to testify against the defendant. Eyewitness misidentification. <clears throat> Inter police interrogation induced false confessions. Right? We think an innocent person wouldn't confess to something that they didn't do, but empirical research shows us, the cases and the empirical research show us that that in fact does happen. Um, misconduct by police and prosecutors and ineffective assistance of the trial counsel. These are all recognized as immediate contributing causes for wrongful convictions and sort of red flags. Uh, but we also know that beside, behind these immediate precipitating causes, there are more entrenched systemic and cultural causes, including and especially racial bias. In Massachusetts, the Supreme Judicial Court commissioned a study of the entire state criminal legal system. And that study concluded that there were racial disparities at every stage of our state's criminal system, from arrest to charging decisions, to verdicts, to punishment. But at most stages, the study concluded they lacked the data to attribute causation. So we have very clear evidence of racialized impact and a lack of data to meet the legal standards for proving intentional discrimination. These disparities also exist in the area of wrongful convictions. Innocent Black people are far more likely to be wrongfully convicted of crimes than innocent white people on average, they serve more time in prison for the crimes that they didn't commit, and official misconduct occurs more frequently in their cases. And we see this also in the cases of the Boston College Innocence Program. So in the last four years, our program has successfully moved to vacate the convictions of seven people, six of whom were wrongfully convicted of murder and sentenced to spend the rest of their lives in prison. Five of those six were non-white. In one case, in the case of our client, Frances Choi, the court that vacated her conviction found that the prosecutors who prosecuted her over the course of three trials, the first two trials re resulted in uh, mistrials, harbored intentional anti-Asian racial bias against her and her family members, and in general, all Asian people. Um, and they were, if the case was unusual in that the proof of that was in the prosecutor's emails that they sent to each other over the eight years that they prosecuted Francis. 
In a recent case, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court vacated the conviction of a Black Muslim because his appointed criminal defense lawyer had posted on social media evidence of his anti-Black and anti-Muslim animus. And the court held that that is a structural conflict of interest to have an attorney who has so clearly exhibited bias against you based on your race and religion. But those cases, the Choi case and the Duke case are rare because rarely do you have such explicit statements of racial animus. And what we see up close in our other cases is that you know and feel with every fiber of your body that race played a role in the wrongful conviction, but you are lacking the evidence to meet the doctrinal elements that courts have set up to prove that the conviction was caused by racial discrimination. In 2020, following the police killing of George, George Floyd, all seven justices then sitting of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court wrote a letter to the entire Massachusetts bench and bar. In the letter, the justices acknowledged that in our system, black lives are not treated with the dignity and respect afforded white lives. And they called on all judges in the state to act to root out any conscious or unconscious bias in their courtrooms. They also called on every member of the legal community to quote, re-examine why too often our criminal justice system fails to treat African-Americans the same as white Americans and to recommit ourselves to the systemic change needed to make equality under the law an enduring reality for all. This must be a time, not just of reflection, but of action. And so with that call to action, that is why today's conversation is so important. How does race contribute to wrongful convictions? How extensive is the problem? What can judges and lawyers and all of us do about it? And to have that conversation, we are so blessed to have a panel of criminal defense and civil rights attorneys who bring with them extraordinary experience and perspective. I am going to introduce each of them all too briefly. They have all directed me to call them by their first name, so that's what we're gonna do. And I'm gonna ask you to hold your applause for the end. I'm gonna introduce the panelists from your left to your right. Um, so first, I'm so pleased to introduce Jeff Robinson, who's the Rappaport Distinguished Professor at Boston College Law School. Jeff is a national thought and conversation leader on racism in America. He has over three decades of experience as a criminal defense attorney and a racial justice activist with the American Civil Liberties Union. He is the CEO of the Who We Are Project, which is a project he founded, which educates about how America's history of slavery and white supremacy has led to persistent racial inequality and promotes conversation about change. Um, he also teaches a class here at BC Law on that subject. And um, Jeff, I'm so pleased that you're joining us. Um, to his left is the Honorable Geraldine Hines, the Huber Distinguished Visiting Professor at Boston College Law School. Jerry, it's hard for me to do that. <laughs> um, it just comes out of my head, just science. Um, Jerry is a Mississippi native who grew up in the segregated South. She had a stellar career as a criminal defense and civil rights attorney um, and also an education law attorney. She was a co-founder of the first law firm in Boston, headed by all black women. She then had a distinguished career as a jurist and she is one of few to have served on all three levels of the Massachusetts courts. She was a superior court trial judge, a judge on the Mass Court of Appeals, and then a justice on the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, the first black woman appointed to that distinguished court. She now teaches a course on race, policing, and the constitution. Looking for you, Jerry. Um, joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, I see there's a Michigan Law Library that I recognize from my youth, um, is Professor Sam Gross. He is a professor emeritus at the University of Michigan Law School. His published scholarship includes a, a vast number of articles on topics such as false confessions, eyewitness misidentification, racial profiling, and capital punishment. 
In death penalty cases, Sam helped to litigate issues relating to race discrimination, jury selection, and the constitutionality of the risk of executing innocent people. He is the co-founder of the National Registry of Exonerations, a detailed online database of all of the known exonerations in the United States since 1989. Um, he works there with a tremendous staff of scholars and researchers, including uh, Pulitzer Prize award-winning reporter Maurice Posley. Um, he was, Sam was the lead author of the National Registry of Exonerations 2022 report on race and wrongful convictions. And I'm grateful, Sam, that you're with us today. Um, and last but not least is Jared Adams, a criminal defense and civil rights attorney. Jared is the co-founder and the president of Life After Justice, an exoneree-led nonprofit dedicated to preventing and remedying wrongful convictions and supporting and empowering exonerees. Jarrett was himself wrongfully convicted as a teenager and imprisoned for a decade for a crime he did not commit. After his exoneration, he went to college and law school and did a post-grad fellowship in the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, which was the same federal court that almost a decade earlier vacated his wrongful conviction. His book, Redeeming Justice from Defendant to Defender, um, my fight for equity on both sides of a broken system is available here um, for purchase. Please join me in welcoming these extraordinary conversation partners. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Janet, I'm going to turn first to you. It's all, all of us involved in the innocence movement see very clearly that the exonerated and the free but binding are the heart and soul of this movement and also the most powerful teachers. What can you share with us about your experience of wrongful conviction and how it informs your work as an attorney at a nonprofit work? Thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you uh, to uh, the clinic. Um, I'm sorry. I heard those keys coming. I knew something was wrong. I, I want to thank you all for bringing me out, Sharon. I want to um, Charlotte, uh, who I am so fond of, and a colleague as well, also at the Rally Court Center. Um, and it's a pleasure to be on this panel with these, these panelists. Um, and also to be in a room with Sean. Uh, we got Steve. Um, the Meet You Brothers is, is, you know, it's a hug from here on now, you know. Um, when, I, when I think about my experience, there are certain critical points throughout my journey um, that unfortunately I'm still seeing today. And I'll give you a prime example of that. So this is 1998 and I'm 17 years old. Um, I don't have a story of being in the streets. Um, I had a grandmother who was from Jackson, Mississippi, uh, grandfather from Cleveland, Mississippi. And they brought my aunts and my uncles one by one from um, what was supposed to be uh, the end of, of, of slavery, um, but they were still in the cotton fields then. And he brought them up one by one. And my mother wasn't born until my grandfather got back from the war where he almost died. Um, and my mother was born. And I think about, um, in, in writing the book, I thought about my history. I thought about how my grandfather almost died on the beach, received a Purple Heart, but couldn't get a house when he got back to Chicago. Um, and then I took myself to the journey of me being 17 years old. I'm on my way to college, um, got the invitation of a lifetime. You know, my friends were already in college. They invited me to a party and it forever changed the trajectory of my life. And I'm going through this experience this entire time, believing that truth trumps everything, or at least it's supposed to. But that's not what happened. You know, I was, was joined by two Black friends, both college educated, not gang banging, not tattoos on their face, all the stereotypes that you see follow young black men. That wasn't us. It still couldn't save us from a system that co continuously referred to us throughout the trial as a young black man from Chicago. Um, and that's how we were treated. And I was sentenced to serve 28 years. And I remember when the Wisconsin Innocence Project worked to, to, to get my conviction reversed. 
I remember mm -hmm. the day before pacing, you know, my cell, because I just wanted my mother and my aunts to hear the vindication, just like they heard the character assassination. And in a blink of an eye, the judge slammed her gavel, dismissed all the charges, um, disappeared in the back. The prosecutor disappeared. And I turned around to that same familiar face with those wrinkles and creases of anguish. And I told her we were done crying. From that point, um, I was able to get therapy, uh, go on to, to, to graduate from um, undergrad at Loyola, I mean, undergrad at Roosevelt in Chicago. Uh, then I went to Loyola and graduated. And I knew that I was playing a severe game of catch up, right? At this time, the coming home, I was 26 turning 27. In 1998, um, this may date me, but there were no <laughs> cell phones like that. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, That'll be the interruption. You know, 1998. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> in this, in this room, right? I don't know who in this Well, there are some in this room who knew what it was like uh, to have to find a pay phone. But that was, that was the reality. Yeah. If you had a cell phone <laughs> in 1998, it usually came with a 007 briefcase. <laughs> pages were in. So it was a, it was just a changing world. And coming home, I knew I needed to, to, to play catch up more. So I, I understood that I would always have this testimony. And that's what I called what I went through, success testimony. Um, but I wanted to be the goods as an attorney. I felt like there wasn't enough of us directly impacted that were respected for our, our, our legal um, prowess as opposed to our story. So I, I did the, the fellowship in the Southern Circuit and I finished in the Southern District of New York. And then as I started to practice after working at the Innocence Project um, for a year and a half, I opened up my first office in New York and we still deal with the struggle of diversity. And here's why diversity is so important. When you have 90 plus percent white males being prosecutors, and you have the opposite of the defendants that go before the courts, and this, this goes to the bench as well, it is a struggle for some to see the empathy and sympathy in those who do not look like them or that they have no relation to other than by a book. And not everyone who does not look the same is inherently racist, but there are some unconscious biases that we all have. This is why diversity is important because maybe diversity would have made the judge look at me and my attorney and realize my attorney was a year or so out of law school and was ill prepared to handle a case such as mine when I was facing 80 years and she would have provided me effective counsel because that is why my conviction was reversed. My lawyer failed to investigate and there was a witness that the police intentionally did not turn over his entire statement. And that's what led to the Seventh Circuit unanimously reversing my conviction. But this was 10 years of damage that was already done. And it always ends the same way. I was just sharing this with, with, you know, with Sean. There is the case reversal, there's the pizza party, and then the camera stopped clicking. Mm -hmm. And we have to find a way to go from that to implementing laws and to everybody joining forces to push the same ball. It's way too many different organizations, and we all need to figure out how to link arms together and push the ball together which is why afterwards I created Life After Justice, which was, was, was directly from notes of how I got to where I was now to try to implement the same process because I know I'm not, I'm not a magic trick. I know with the proper support in, in reentry tools such as therapy, there are more success stories and more people who can go from just being the story to telling their story and creating other stories. And that is what Life After Justice is about. That is what my entire journey is about. And I am practicing what I preach right now as well and learning that I can't do it all by myself. And that's why it's important to come and be in front of new students and, and, and legal scholars and, 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 and try to get everyone to understand that we all should live each and every day um, protecting um, this society uh, the same way we want to deliver it to our kin coming up behind us. And we can't do that segregate. We're missing out. Because if I would have stayed in prison with this 28-year sentence, 
I would not be released until February of 2024, and I would not be representing people and exonerating folks and able to share my testimony. And this is why it's so important for us to, to matter, no matter how difficult it is, to continue to have the difficult conversations of how we diversify this and get rid of the old guard. It's not working. We're better all together. Thank you. Aaron, your story is so powerful, and yet, as you point out, you are you are not alone. Um, and in that regard, there is no overstating the importance of the National Registry of Exonerations. My students who are here know that I talk about it in every single class. Um, we use it in defense of our innocent clients. We bring the data from the registry forward in our policy reform discussions. And that's true not only here in Massachusetts, but around the country. Um, so now I am going to turn to uh, Sam Grossman and ask Sam Gross and ask you, what can you share with us about the data that you have gathered in the registry and what it tells us about race and wrongful convictions? Well, what I can share with you first is, this, is my screen is a screen. So uh, I'm going to share with you that screen. Uh, there we go. Uh, does that work? Yes, I see it. OK, good. I see it, too. OK. Um, so uh, this is the report that Sharon mentioned. This is the Race and Wrongful Convictions in the United States 2022, um, which came out uh, almost, uh, almost exactly a year ago. Um, it was, uh, as Sharon said, a report by uh, the National. Uh, how do I get this? There we go. Okay. Um, by the National Registry of Exonerations, which as of today has recorded 300 and, uh, excuse me, 3,385 exonerations. Those are the ones we know about, as with everything else in this area, there are exonerations that we don't know about. And we'd love to hear about it if anybody knows and can tell us. Um, and others that um, aren't part of this individual list, I'll mention them in passing later on. But I'm going to go through the information that we have on race very quickly, um, just to set the basis for discussions that follow. Uh, this is the basic structure, which Sharon has already mentioned. Uh, a majority of the exonerations we know about are African Americans, Black uh, defendants. Uh, about a third are Hispanic. The uh, excuse me, about a third are white. Uh, about twelve percent are Hispanic. Uh, we the report that we published does not include evidence of disparities by um, uh, ethnicity, Hispanic or non-Hispanic, because the information on that is too poor. This is a good, a decent estimate of the overall number, but uh, uh, the details are bad because the information we have comes from police and from uh, media sources which over the period we've been dealing with um, have not reported Hispanic ancestry very well or consistently. In any case, you immediately see that the proportion of black defendants is way out of proportion to the number of black uh, people in the population as a whole. Uh, I'm gonna talk about how that plays out in the context of three crimes, the three crimes that include the largest numbers of exonerations that we have. And the first one is murder cases, where you see that innocent Black people are more than seven times more likely to be convicted of murder than uh, innocent white people. Uh, that applies to those who are sentenced to death. It applies to basically every category of murder. Uh, this, of course, is a huge disparity. A lot of it is due to one of the great national tragedies, a national disgrace, in fact, which is the very high rate of homicide in the black community, uh, which is reflected in part uh, 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 in, uh, well, in uh, this shows the disparity, but it's reflected in part uh, in uh, the prison population. Uh, blacks constitute about 40% of those who are sentenced to death, excuse me, sentenced to uh, prison for murder. Uh, and most of that is, uh, the overwhelming majority of that is not because they were falsely convicted. It's because black people are much more likely to be victims of murder in this country. And those murders are generally interracial. And the suspects, as a result, 
the people who are known to have committed the murders in most cases are also black. And as a result, a high proportion of those who are convicted who are not guilty are black. Uh, uh, these are not people who brought it on themselves. These are innocent victims of uh, the murders. They're, in fact, secondary victims of murders, uh, as are the families of those who were killed, their friends, the community as a whole. And uh, uh, they're there uh, because they live in and resemble the people who come in, in the areas where um, Blacks are the majority of the population and they physically resemble uh, those who committed the murders. That, however, does not explain the entire disparity. You see here that 40% of the <clears throat> prison population uh, of those who are convicted of murder are Black, and 55% of exonerations are Black. That's not a small difference. It means that among those who are convicted of murder, Black defendants are about 80% more likely to be innocent than those uh, uh, who are not Black. And um, there are many possible explanations for this. Uh, unconscious biases, uh, differences in policing in white and black communities and so forth. But the cases that we have also include a fair number of cases of uh, clear and sometimes explicit racial bias. In some cases, you know, uh, in, the, in some cases, stone cold racism uh, uh, that uh, uh, explain uh, the the um, a fact that these particular defendants were convicted despite their innocence. Uh, and there are other differences. Uh, the exonerations of Black defendants that we know of include a higher rate of misconduct by police officers than the exonerations of other defendants. Uh, and they spend more time in prison before they're released. So, uh, so we have uh, two basic factors that result that contribute to this extremely large difference in the rate of innocent people being convicted of murder. Uh, one is the high rate of homicide, which is a tragedy that hurts people who are innocent and convicted of murder as well as other people. And the other is racial discrimination and racism. Uh, sexual assault or rape. Uh, here again, you see a comparable difference to the one we saw for, for murder, but somewhat larger, innocent black people are almost eight times more likely than innocent white people to be falsely convicted of rape. Uh, and that a prisoner serving time for sexual assault is more than three times more likely to be innocent if he is black than if he is white. Uh, in this case, the difference in rape is not primarily explained uh, not the, uh, by the difference in the prison population. You see that uh, black defendants are overrepresented among rape uh, 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 defendants who are sentenced to prison, uh, 21%, but uh, uh, black exonerations for rape are a strong majority, 59%. Uh, and the basic reason for this, the one that uh, is uh, best known and uh, accounts for most of the cases, is the major issue in most rape cases that result in exonerations. Three quarters of rape exonerations are cases in which the only issue was the identity of the attacker. Uh, there was uh, no dispute about the fact that the victim, and the victims, uh, um, uh, men and people with other gender identities do get raped. Uh, the exonerations we know about are all, are all cases in which the victims are women. Uh, uh, and, and women are the overwhelming majority of uh, victims in rape cases. Uh, in those cases, in 75% of the cases, the victim was raped, and the question is, who did it? Uh, and in almost 90% of the cases in which that's the only issue, there was a mistaken witness identification. In almost all of those cases, the mistaken identification was made by the victim. Uh, uh, there's a reason for this. Uh, uh, if the victim was killed in the process, which does happen, although thankfully not in the great majority of rapes, then it would be classified not as a rape, but as a homicide, as a murder. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, the, the, and the victim wouldn't be available to identify or misidentify the person who committed the crimes. In two-thirds of the cases in which 
an innocent defendant was convicted of rape based on an eyewitness misidentification. Uh, that uh, defendant was black. And in two thirds of those cases, uh, the victim was white. This is in a country in which the rate of convictions of, um, uh, of uh, black defendants for raping white victims uh, is quite low. It's, in this, the, it's actually quite hard to get decent statistics on it, but um, which is, if anybody here is, happens to be a criminal justice researcher, uh, you will know this. Criminal justice uh, data statistics in the United States are terrible. So basic questions like the race of the victim in rape convictions are not information that you can generally get. But uh, as far as we can tell, the proportion of uh, convictions for sexual assault in which the victim was white and the attacker was black, somewhere between five and 10%, some not, uh, 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 not if it's over 10%, I'd be very surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if it's lower than 5%. Uh, what this translates into is that essentially half of the cases in that context where this is a small minority, this racial combination is a small minority of convictions, about half of ca the cases in which someone was convicted based on a misidentification, that is a uh, black defendant who's convicted of raping a white victim. Uh, the biggest reason for this uh, almost certainly, is the danger of eyewitness misidentification in cross racial of eyewitness errors in cross racial uh, racial identifications, which in the United States is particularly bad for identifications of black people, black strangers by white uh, witnesses or white victims, for obvious reasons. Uh, Black people in the United States cannot go through their lives without spending a lot of time dealing with white people and learning how to, uh, to, uh, to uh, identify their faces. Uh, many white people do not know many black people or only know one or two and have not learned uh, very well how to identify different black people. Uh, uh, this is a well-known problem. Uh, it's uh, well-established and uh, 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 is reflected here. But again, it is not the only reason for this disparity. Uh, the disparity exists in the cases in which there was not as big a disparity, but a different, a smaller but sizable disparity in which the rape did not have anything to do with identity or in which there was no mistaken witness identifications. And some of the cases involve uh, explicit racism or unmistakable racism. It's as bad or worse than murder cases, which again, of course, is no surprise because there's probably no issue in uh, criminal justice in the United States, which is historically more incendiary and has caused more harm than false accusations of rape against black men who were charged uh, with raping white women when they didn't do it. Uh, uh, moving on at high speed, uh, drug cases. This is actually, uh, I think, the most complicated and um, uh, uh, and uh, least understood uh, set of cases and involves the largest number of people who are falsely accused of crimes by far, but we don't know about most of them. Um, of the drug crime exonerees that we know about, 69% are black and 16% is are white. That means that nearly, that black people, innocent black people are nearly 20 times more likely to be convicted of drug crimes than white witnesses. This is a huge disparity. Remember for rape and for murder, it was like seven times or eight times, already fast disparities. Here it's much larger than that. How do we get there? Well, there are two streams, and I'll talk about them very quickly because uh, we're trying to leave as much time as we can for discussion. Uh, the first thing to know about these cases, and I'm not sure you can uh, decide for this graph quickly, but uh, this is uh, the top line here, the blue line, is the cases of exonerations uh, uh, for drug for drug uh, crimes uh, over time. And you see how it's it's very lumpy; it jumps up and down a lot. And then you see under that columns that represent the exonerations in particular counties. And what you see is that these cases are heavily clustered in particular counties where they occurred in a sequence of a few years. So 
Los Angeles County had a bunch of drug exonerations in 1999 and 2000. Uh, Swisher County in Texas had a bunch in 2003. Harris County, that's Houston in Texas, had a bunch in 2014 to 2016. And Cook County, you know, uh, Jared's home county, um, uh, had a large number starting around 2017, which continues into 20, 2023. Uh, what are these? Uh, uh, look at the Harris County cases first. Uh, it, since 2012, there have been 153 exonerations in Harris County and Houston who pled guilty to drug possession. And then after that, drug tests were run on the material that was seized from them. And it was determined uh, that they weren't carrying illegal drugs. Uh, how did that happen? Well, what happened in most of these cases is that they were arrested based on field tests for drugs. Some cases, uh, the, uh, the police officer saw pills and said these are uh, Xanax or something else that's illegal and they turned out to be Excedrin um, or something like that. But in most cases, they subjected some material to a test, some powder or some crumbled, uh, you know, some uh, crumbled uh, material um, uh, or um, uh, some leafy substance or whatever. And the test read it's cocaine or it's uh, 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 methamphetamine or whatever. And they're arrested on the basis of this. These tests are notoriously unreliable. They've been shown to produce a very high rate of errors. Uh, they've been shown to produce false positives for things like, there you see it, chocolate bars, you know, uh, powdered milk. Uh, the one that I like best is uh, some of them have produced false positives. That is, told, said that drugs are present when nothing was put into them. You just mix them with air, uh, and they come up with false positives. Uh, uh, they are not good enough to use as evidence in court, but they are considered to constitute probable cause and justify an arrest. And what then happens is that the defendants are held in jail. And if they can't make bail, which is going to be true for most defendants who are poor, especially if they have uh, a prior conviction, say another a prior drug conviction or a prior conviction for anything, bail might be several thousand, two or three thousand dollars. They won't be able to put up the money to get a bail bondsman and get them out. They'll show up in court and they'll be told, here's your deal. Uh, you can plead guilty now and do two weeks in jail, of which you've already done one week, or go home today or go home in a month. Or you can wait for a trial, which will take six or 12 months. And after that, if you're convicted in Harris County at that time, you might get for possession of marijuana or possession of, uh, of uh, uh, heroin, you might get a year in prison or two years in prison. What do you want to do? And almost everybody pleads guilty. And this is not limited to Harris County. This is not limited to Harris County at all. But in Harris County, unlike as far as we know any other place, there was a regular practice of then testing the drugs, the supposed drugs that were seized from people after they pled guilty. Most places, they say pled guilty cases over, throw the drugs away or whatever. And then we find out that there are a lot of errors there. And 62% of those guilty pleas were African Americans in a county in which 20% of the residents are black. Why is that? Is it because African-Americans use drugs at a higher rate than other people? Unlikely, because among other things, these people weren't using drugs. Um, and the evidence that we have shows that whites, blacks, and Hispanics basically all use illegal drugs at about the same rate. Uh, this is racial profiling. This is what happens as a result of racial profiling. Uh, racial profiling means the police are much more likely to stop and search and, and after searching arrest African-Americans for drug crimes than whites. Most of the people they arrest are guilty. But if they're going to make mistakes, that's who gets hit. And the number, rate of mistakes is not that small. And if we had this program of testing drugs after guilty pleas across the country, we might know of thousands and thousands of these cases. OK, last one, really quickly, Harris County. Uh, that's a different problem. Uh, uh, this is Sergeant Ronald Watts. I, I expect that Jared has heard a lot about him. I'm not sure anybody else has. Um, he was 
in uh, 2013, he was convicted in federal court for uh, taking a bribe from somebody he thought was uh, a drug dealer, but turned out to be a federal agent. After that, um, what happened was people started paying attention or were forced, I should say, the state's attorney was eventually forced to start paying attention to complaints that had been going on for a while that Ronald Watts and his subordinates were terrorizing the residents of the Ida B. Wells um, uh, 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 housing, housing development by basically going up and down the buildings and the halls and uh, you know, uh, you know uh, barging into people's houses, uh, arresting them for drugs if they had any, uh, and then taking bribes to release them, uh, you know, stealing drugs, stealing money. Uh, and if they couldn't find enough drugs and money asking for bribes and if people wouldn't give them, then planting drugs on them and arresting them for those. Uh, and those are the cases we see here. Uh, at the, uh, in this point, by 2019, we knew of, uh, or the New York Times reported that 63 uh, people had their cases reversed and got exonerated because this pattern came to light after Ronald Watts was uh, uh, after Ronald Watts was arrested uh, for stealing money and uh, taking bribes uh, in a uh, in a uh, in a federal sting. Uh, that continued. If you go back up here, you see the numbers are higher than that. As of today, I think I've lost count of the number, but I think going on 150 people have been exonerated in Cook County uh, through you know, uh, through 20 the end of uh, 2022 and part of 2023. And uh, that, I'm sorry, did, did you know the actual number? Yeah, it's, 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 it's still rising. But one of the things that I want to point out is this. Look at the time it took from the time that he was tried, convicted, to the time that they're getting out. Yep. Look at the time it took. It took almost a decade, and they're still doing it. And the thing about it is, just think about this. Had it not been for federal intervention, these black women and men, they would have never been believed. And but, they have these records. Absolutely. It's, 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 for what it's worth, uh, the main uh, person who's responsible for this is a defendant by the name of Baker, whose name I can't, the first name I, I, I've, I've forgotten, who was, uh, who was framed by uh, Ronald Watts and his subordinates twice. Uh, he wouldn't take it lying down. He went to trial the first time. His wife got uh, his wife got arrested the second time together with him. He pled guilty the second time so that she could get a deal that would allow her to stay out and take care of the kids. Uh, he kept he kept badgering them with complaints about it. And then after Watts and his his uh, uh, subordinate, uh, Colin Muhammad, were convicted, finally got attention and got this moving. Uh, I, I should say, most of these people were not in prison by the time they were exonerated. Uh, and very few of them were in prison because they got shorter terms. Uh, some of them got straight probation, some of them got months, uh, 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 some of them got a, a few years. And the length of time this took uh, is, I mean, th this is when it first happened. I think the first exonerations uh, that we see are just about then, and most of them are several years later. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, that's not all because of lagging, uh, because of it's Sorry, I really. Oh, I, uh, I've been running on. Sorry, Jared just tempted me to keep going. But, but, but the main thing to know is this is a case we know about, and we have no clear idea how many other cases like this of this sort of uh, abuse by police officers who are uh, who are uh, improving their records and their careers by arresting innocent uh, black people for crimes. The drug crimes they didn't commit. We have no idea how common that is. Okay, sorry to take so long. No, no, thank you. It's so um, incredibly important to have the facts and the compilation of all of this information. Sam is so powerful, and I think you know one of the things that Sam noted right at the outset is that when we're talking about the harms, right, you have to start at the individual level. Right, and think about, well, what if what happened to Jarrett happened to you? That when you were 17, if you were wrongly arrested and locked up for the next decade of your life, where would you be today? Or what if that happened to your parents? Would you even be here today? And then to think about that on this massive scale and to know that the people harmed include, of course, first and foremost, the wrongly convicted, also their families, 
parents whose children are in prison, children growing up without their parents who are innocent and wrongfully convicted. And then also in Sam referenced this, um, where there was a crime, uh, there isn't always a crime, right? Sometimes people are wrongfully convicted of, of a harm that occurred that wasn't a crime, but where there is a crime, then another whole set of victims of this are the original crime victims who thought that they got justice when in fact they didn't. And then when the exoneration happens, everything is also reopened for them. And, th and then there are all the cases where no crime was committed at all. Yes, exactly. So Jerry, um, you, you are famous in all of your work, whether as an attorney or as a judge, as now as a professor and in your uh, quote unquote retirement, <laughs> your post judicial service and leadership, which is quite extensive for addressing the realities of race and racial bias um, in policing and the legal system. And I'm wondering if you would be willing to share an example of how you did that on the court and also why more judges don't do that. But they're not me. <laughs> um, I'm up here so I can take off my mask. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said about how these wrongful convictions happen. A little, little bit of it, um, police officers, but there's also the corrupt and ethically challenged uh, prosecutors. There's a whole system of people and things that make these wrongful convictions happen. And we're supposed to have guardrails in place uh, to keep these things from happening. And judges are supposed to be a part of the guardrails. And, you know, it's, it's a complicated question. We won't have time to talk about okay, this is the problem, what do we do? Um, but I just want to take just a little piece of what I think about what we can do. And I'm just gonna give you my take prompted by Sharon on one way that wrongful convictions escape the judicial guardrails that are supposed to be there. You know, you think of the judge, the person who's sitting up there high above everybody else with the black robe on and everybody rises when they come in the room and they have to be addressed as your honor. You know, you give those people a lot of credit for making things right uh, when they happen in the courtroom. But that's not always the case. So in the seven minutes that I have, <laughs> uh, that's what we, told, we, we were told we had. Uh, I just want to give you my take on that one way that these wrongful co convictions is, escape the judicial guardrails and what you as advocates can do to make judges more active in addressing the problem. So what can judges do to mitigate the problem? Um, in talking about judges and wrongful convictions, I do want to start with the point that was made and that Sam just talked about in their report. Uh, it documented the stark racial disparity in wrongful convictions for drug offenses. And he noted that this disparity is driven by racial profile. Okay, but we have a Supreme Court decision those of you who have taken criminal procedure, con law, you know about Wren versus United States, where the Supreme Court said racial profiling uh, is not unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment because race is not part of the reasonableness calculus of the Fourth Amendment. So what can judges do about that? You've got a Supreme Court that's telling you that race has nothing to do with the Fourth Amendment. And you see these cases coming in where you know that they're there because some police officer racially profiled uh, some Black man or some Black woman. So what, do you, what are you going to do? Um, well, I want to say that judges don't have to validate the fruits 
of racial profiling when it comes to the courtroom. And I want to back that up with a case from my own experience that Sharon just talked about. Uh, it was the Warren case that was decided in 2016 by the Supreme Judicial Court. Uh, it undercut the value of racial profiling in, as part of the so-called crime-fighting arsenal that police officers have. Now, Jimmy Warren was racially profiled on a cold winter night in Roxbury uh, about an hour after a burglary had been reported and the suspects were only identified as two black males wearing hoodies. <laughs> and about an hour later and about a mile away from where the burglary happened, Jimmy Warren and his friend uh, encountered these two police officers who racially profiled them. Jimmy Warren ran away and the police officers figured out how to meet him on the other side of the park where he was going. They caught up with him. Uh, eventually a gun was found in an area where uh, he had run. And so he filed a motion to suppress. The trial judge denied the motion to suppress. He appealed the case. It went to the appeals court and there was an extraordinary effort on the appeals court to uh, Two, two dissenting judges in this case, I think they dissented, um, cited data which showed that Black people in Boston, the kind of statistics that you see here, disparate, uh, Black people in Boston were more likely than white people to be stopped by the police. And um, Sometimes the police officers would find something and sometimes they didn't. Uh, but they found this gun on um, Jimmy Warren. So the case comes to the SJC. So what are we supposed to do? He ran away and the Supreme Court has told us that flight in a high crime area is all that a police officer needs to stop somebody. It's reasonable suspicion. That was the Wardlow uh, case, if you remember that. So um, what does the SJC do? And I'm the judge who got the assignment to write this opinion in the case. Uh, but I'm not some ordinary judge. I'm, I'm not being modest. I'm, I'm saying that to say that I knew the area intimately where this happened, where the burglary happened, the park where he was uh, stopped by the police. All of that happened in my neighborhood. I know the people who run around there. And so I understood what was going on with this case. And I brought my experience, uh, my background, my familiarity with the area uh, to my colleagues, my, my six colleagues who sat with me to help decide how this case was, was, was gonna be decided. And we were lucky, we had the benefit of data. And I think that that's, that's a message that I wanna give to you law students. When you're, when you're doing advocacy, it can't be you talking. You have to have something to back it up. You have to have data. And we had data. Northeastern University had done a study of, of uh, stop and frisk in Boston. And the data was just simply overwhelming. And so what we said was that Flight cannot be considered as consciousness of guilt because Black people in Boston have a reason to run from the police. They run from the police because they want to avoid the indignity of being stopped by the police when you haven't even done anything. Okay, Jimmy Warren was guilty, but factually guilty. But most of the people who get stopped like this are not guilty of anything. And there's nothing that we do about it because there's no case that they can bring. So 
In the two minutes that I have left, I just want to say that this is how judges can put their finger on the scale when we're talking about wrongful convictions, recognizing how they happen, educating themselves on how they happen, and understanding that the person who's in front of them could possibly be there because some police officer has profiled them and picked them out when ordinarily they would be permitted to go on their way. I mean, there's there's a lot more that I could say about this, but in the interest of time, I'll just leave it at that and say that diversity matters on the bench too. Okay, um, Jeff, thank you for your patience. You got to think of yourself here as the anchor leg of this all-star relay. Um, can you help us put this problem in a broader perspective and consider, you know, what all of us, attorney, prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges, and people in other fields, what can we do to make things better? Well, I think I'd, I'd like to say that, uh, uh, and I'm just expressing my opinion, um, we know exactly why all this stuff is happening. There's no question about why this is happening. We can look at the statistics and say it's not quite clear why this is going on, that's going on. It's absolutely clear. <laughs> There's no question about it. And if we simply deal with our history, that history will give the answers to why certain things are happening this way. And that's one of the things about knowing your history because if you don't, people can throw out some shit and tell you it's new <laughs> when it's not, yeah. when it's old. And so, for instance, and I agree, like the the, the, the violence in, in my community in terms of people getting killed, it's like, is that a tragedy? Yeah, it's a tragedy, but there's a reason for it. Give me any racial group in this country. Now, I don't need 400 years. Just give me about 50. And let me let me decide where they're going to live. Let me deny them opportunity. Let me put the police on them and police every single thing that they do. Let me put a gun store and a liquor store in every neighborhood. And I'll produce the exact same kind of statistics in any racial group anywhere in the world. So we know what the problem is. And part of the, the, the message that I would give to you as people who are entering this profession is that there is a culture that exists. We saw this black police officer in Chicago doing all these things in the black community. And some people will say, well, see, that's like, it's like the term black on black crime. Have you ever heard the term white on white crime? <laughs> no, because black on black crime is a kind of thing that suggests they're doing it to each other. Yeah. They're so depraved that they will even do it to each other. And the fact of the matter is that throughout history, across every continent on this planet, some members of oppressed groups have always identified with the oppressors. Why do you think the Israelis spent 20 years after World War II prosecuting Jewish people who collaborated with the Nazis. So this is not a new story or a confusing story. This is just a story about white supremacy and oppression. And if you are going into a prosecutor's office, there will be a culture there that will tell you, ignore these things, everything is okay. In the city of Seattle, over a 20 year period, 7% Black population in the city, and we were 40% of the drug possession arrests. That's right. Now, there is no question about Black people smoking weed more than white people. That's ridiculous. <laughs> every, every group in, the, in this country uses drugs at about the same level, so I don't want to hear any of that. But somebody in the prosecutor's office was filing these cases. And even though there's 7% Black people in Seattle, they didn't think there was anything unusual about, man, sure are a whole lot of Black people getting arrested <laughs> for marijuana. Yes, I won't say anything. And you know what? 
the public defenders were defending these cases, the vast majority of them, and nobody in their office stood up and said, you know what? A whole lot of our clients are black in these drug possession cases. I wonder why that is. <laughs> and so part of it is just to be awake, to be awake about our history, about the culture that you're going into when you enter a prosecutor's office or a public defender's office, or when you clerk for a judge. And after a suppression hearing or after a trial, when you're back there in chambers saying something to that judge, like, did you see that? Do you understand what's going on there? Judge, are you going to do something about this? Because what I can guarantee you is this. If you go into these jobs and say nothing and do nothing different, nothing will change. I guarantee you nothing will change. But, you know, who made her a, a Supreme Court judge? I don't know, but she got on the Supreme Court and she did something about it. This guy was 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 put away in a garbage can and said, no, I don't think I'm going to take that. So there are examples of courage throughout the legal system in America. And the courage that I'm asking from y'all is nowhere near what was required from these two people. The courage I'm asking for y'all is just to know your history when you go into these jobs and don't be silent when you see this stuff happening. Speak up, say something about it. And who knows, you may talk to a judge that says, well, I'm now gonna write an opinion. And now I'm teaching in Boston College and all over the country about uh, Commonwealth versus Warren, because everybody in America knows that Black people have a reason to run from the police. That has nothing to do with whether you've committed a, a crime. Everyone knows that. And we know that from our history. Ten-year-old boy in a Chicago uh, uh, house housing project who is doing nothing, has committed no crime. Cops roll up looking for something, and he runs away. They chase him, they handcuff him, and he urinates all over himself. And they say to him, that'll teach you not to run from the police. The real question is, why does a 10-year-old who is doing nothing wrong, who has nothing to hide, why does that 10-year-old run from police? Because that's the culture that we have allowed to exist in our country. And that culture is being called out now. So my request to you is don't be silent and don't be full. Well, we have to have this proof. There is all kinds of proof in the statistics that we've been looking at, in the statistics that we've talked about. Put it in front of judges and make them throw up in their mouths if they are going to let this continue. That's what happened in the state of Washington with Batson versus Kentucky. And I'm about to quit here. Batson versus Kentucky, the rule about jury selection. You can't excuse uh, Black people from a jury, but you got to prove it was intentional. And unless you've got the notes and the emails, which still exist sometimes, which shows you how blatant it is in our culture, it's really hard to do that. You know what the Washington State Supreme Court did? They just looked at history and the truth, and they wrote a new rule. And the rule says this. If you try and use a peremptory challenge to exclude a Black person or a person of color, the other side can object. And then here's the standard. If a reasonable person could conclude that race was a part of the reason for excusing the juror, the challenge is not allowed. And what's a reasonable juror? A reasonable juror is defined as a juror who is aware of the history of racial discrimination in jury selection. And the third part of the rule is, here are some reasons that are presumptively unreasonable. Living in a high crime neighborhood, <laughs> translated a black neighborhood. Knowing people who have been uh, involved in the criminal justice system, because my brother and my cousins have been arrested, and I know that, so now I can't sit as a juror. The Supreme Court in the state of Washington said, we're sick of it. 
The Supreme, the Supreme Judicial Court in the state of Massachusetts said, we're sick of it. So don't tell me it can't be done. What you're really saying is, I'm not willing to step out there and do it. And I'm asking y'all not to have that view and that opinion as you go into your late prayers. Okay, so with that call to action, what are your questions for our panelists? And I want to add that that rule about peremptory challenges in Washington was written by none other than Jeffrey Robbins. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. I guess my question is, you know, as our con a society continues to adopt like artificial intelligence and more technology, how do you see that playing into the criminal justice system or in certain wrongful convictions in general? I, I think maybe Sam might be able to answer this better, but I, I hope that we start to keep uh, better data. Um, there's a reason why Sam isn't able to find as many numbers as he as could because it helps improve our points, what Jeff was making, and also what, what Judge was making. Um, when you have the anecdotal evidence, it's hard to live a lot of it, right? And I want to know, again, specific things. You know, um, what's the collateral damage of when someone goes to prison? What, what happens with the families, with the kids? Do the kids go to prison? Does, does the family um, go down? I mean, there are no numbers on that. And there's no way for us to get better in the area if we're not keeping track of its pitfall, pitfalls. And it's, it's intentional. And that's why, you know, before I left, I wanted to say this. Um, there are certain institutions who need to step up. Um, this, this thing about this criminal justice reform, there are going to be pullers at the front, pushers at the back, people holding it together in the middle. And there are institutions such as um, schools, right? We can't get diverse benches and prosecutor's office if we don't have diverse law school classes, right? And that goes for all levels of education. You shouldn't be able to go into the worst neighborhood in Boston and get the player who's putting up 20 points and 20 rebounds, and you can't go get the system who know how to break down law. Something's wrong with that. Mm. Also, big law. How many black led Big powerhouse law firms are made up like this panel. Mm -hmm. There aren't many. So when you think about issues that get tackled in the Supreme Court, it takes what to do that? It takes money, resources, and power. These big firms commit their pro bono hours. They don't necessarily do it on purpose, not to the issues that face our communities, but they just aren't of our communities. So it's not the first thing they think about. We need big powerhouse law firms to put, to put some money and resources and litigation behind because there is more civil rights litigation to be done. That torch was passed to us for us to do something with it. And we've been holding it in our hands for quite some time and we need different institutions to get involved and not just sit on the sideline and do a diversity luncheon because that's, that's what happens at big law firms. And we need everybody in this ring. And Jerry, I know that you're launching an empirical project about incentivized um, testimony. Do you want to talk about that at all in this context? Jared, I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And I, 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 so, so, yeah, I so, so, but it's an amazing example of, of doing what you're calling for. So here's what we're doing in Life After Justice. So we're putting together some research. We're working actually with, with Sam as well um, in, in the, uh, you know, exoneree registry. We're trying to put together numbers that show how criminal cases are affected by incentivized witnesses. And if the, if the state and government and Commonwealth is gonna use incentivized witnesses, they need to provide specialized jury instructions to explain to the jurors the numbers and statistics of people who testify for their own interest and the numbers of, of, of wrongful convictions that have happened as a result, the, the, the incentives, it has to be more than just saying okay, defense, you can argue that this person is lying and bring up his past. It must be inherently written and instructed by a judge to the jurors that this testimony should be highly scrutinized. And these are the numbers that suggest, because if not, you're looking at a system where jurors are, are, are reasonable people, they're us. So more often than not, if it's a tug of war internally in the jurors' room, they ask themselves, not what does the evidence say, 
But man, why would the police say he did it if she did it if she didn't do it, right? Those are the questions that they ask. So if they're tasked with the jury instruction to highly scrutinize, incentivize witnesses, then I think that we, we have um, a better system. And we have to track the numbers and the data on that. And that's what we're doing right now. We're, we're, we're gearing up right now, to, and it's going to be a lot of work. That means that we have to go through each county or start with one county and put together numbers that are purposely and intentionally not kept on purpose. Let's get another question. Um, so it, I know you can, oh, sorry, I, I had, yeah, um, I know you can get involved with the Innocence Project at BC in 2L, 3L, but what can 1Ls do to start kind of getting involved with um, try, try, trying to be uh, more conscious in the um, race and wrongful conviction realm? Well, first of all, you're here. <laughs> so that is the first thing. I mean, I think that there is an, there are endless opportunities to participate in things. Um, this weekend, there's a march and a rally um, downtown in Roxbury um, um, honoring those, especially who are um, still fighting their wrongful convictions. There are a number of events. So we, we put them on the BCIP Facebook page. So like our Facebook page. I think, um, but you're, you know, looking to, there's opportunities to volunteer. I know in 1L here, they want you to concentrate on your cases and on your, on your doctrinal courses. I mean, these are issues you can explore in the critical, critical perspectives class and bring those to that discussion. And, you know, um, PILF and other student organizations are constantly hosting roundtables and discussions. So I would say that those are, those are some ways and come see me. <laughs> Question over there. Yeah, hi, thank you again for coming to talk to us today. Um, I think uh, Mr. Adams kind of touched upon this as well, and so did Mr. Robinson, but I just kind of wanted to ask the panel in general. Um, you mentioned something, Mr. Robert, or Mr. Adams, sorry, when you were talking, is this on? Yes. yes. <laughs> um, when you specifically mentioned your story and your um, defense attorney not necessarily having the proper knowledge or expertise to defend you properly. And then Mr. Robinson, you said more so about like being aware and like knowing our history. So do you think um, just as a panel in general and like all of your experiences, do you think there's something to be said about, um, you know, creating some kind of structuring or programming within the public defender's office for, you know, specifically working with clients that could have who could be innocent and like especially since you said your defense attorney was only one year out right and so especially like myself as a 1L or anyone else just in in law school um you know we're going to be those new attorneys so exactly what kind of advice do you have for us to ensure that you know this doesn't happen again or not this not so it's never gonna happen again but just less likely to happen i think in detail jeff is definitely positioned better to answer um, in terms of, of, of the inner workings of the office. But I'll just state the obvious. Give the public defense system the same amount of resources you give the prosecutor system. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. you, you're talking about a public defender system. You, you have 10 to 15 attorneys sharing one investigator, and all 10 or 15 of those attorneys have at least 30 to 50 cases. Right. If I did that as a as a private practicing attorney, I would be disbarred, right? To have that. That's now a practice. But somehow they're forced to do it and just get by. If you look at the prosecutor's office, they have a lot of their disposal. They can pick up the phone and call the PS, the ATF, the DEA, all of those abbreviated scary letters from, from the government brains. But somehow, some way, we have we and this goes back to the depiction of who needs the help. It's us. You know, it's the, it's the depiction of, of making us look scary. And when you make a person look scary and deserve it of being put away, then you make it easier to go to sleep at night. And that's the issue. Give the public defense system, which, which serves 80, 90% of the population of criminal defendants, give them the same amount of resources. And I argue that they should be given more. And you'll see a different result in, in the lawyering and also the, the, the client's as well. Uh, 
this year is the 60th anniversary of Gideon versus Wainwright, which was the Supreme Court case that created public defenders, essentially. And there are organizations around the country, there has been a revolution going on in public defense in the last 10 years. And it hasn't reached every office, by no means has it. But there are organizations like Gideon's Promise, that is a structure-based organization that is teaching public defender offices how to do client-centered representation mm -hmm. so that the interests of the client are put first above whatever legal st statistic or, or doctrinal evidence or doctrinal standard there is. We're trying to figure out how do we serve this individual client. So there are organizations out there that are really working to change the way public defense works. If you are interested in being a, a public defender and you're looking at a public defense office, the first question you want to ask is, what kind of training program do you have? Because there are excellent training programs. I, when I got out of law school in 1981, I went to the Seattle King County Public Defender. So talk about dating yourself, 1981. <laughs> I went to Seattle King County Public Defender because after, based on what I read, that office and the public defender in Washington, D.C. had the two best training programs. And I got trained before I ever stepped foot into a courtroom. There were senior lawyers in the courtroom with me so that the kind of mistakes that Jared talks about likely would not have happened. And then the final thing I'll say is, I think this is part of the revolution of public defender offices. So you will have a judge that will say, uh, Mr. Adams, I see you're here before me and I'm just making this up. Your father was also had a criminal record and other people in your family. And you know, this is just not acceptable. If I had known when I was practicing what I know now, I would have been saying to judges, don't you dare schedule a sentencing hearing for 20 minutes. We don't be here for three hours. Because <laughs> you want to know why my client and his family have been in this circumstance? Yeah. Let's talk about the history of this city and this county. Every public defender's office should have a resource where there are lawyers, students in colleges. You can always get volunteers there to investigate the history of that county. What's the history of housing segregation in Boston? What's the history of school desegregation in Boston? How was that thought out? Why do the Boston neighborhoods look like they do? In my class yesterday, I put up a slide that showed, you know, uh, it was from 2020. I think it was NPR or some other news agency saying, look how diverse Boston is. And they had this map with a dot on it. A dot equals 150 people. And they had different colored dots for different races. And so you could see there were a whole bunch of different colors. Boston's really diverse. <laughs> but if you just close your eyes and look again, you're like, God damn, Boston's really segregating. <laughs> And so if we're gonna if we're gonna have a system that is going to be judging individuals outside of the context of the systemic problems that we live in, that's on us as criminal defense lawyers. So I'm telling that judge, we are going to put this evidence on. And how do you get it? Like I say, do the research, go to a college, go to prof there are 130 universities around here, and I guarantee you. There are college professors that know this shit. It's just that nobody has ever come to them and asked them to help like this. So part of it is us taking our, our knowledge and our values into these organizations and making the organizations. And Jerry, I know you wanted to talk about um, this type of training and culture shift also in DA's offices. And I'm wondering, I know the time is short, but I wanted to give you a chance to no. Say something about that because I think it's just as important. Well, can I say yes? Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, for the students who are looking for a formed culture in the offices that you go to, don't count on that. What you're doing in your critical perspectives in your first year class, you're learning how to develop your own perspective and invest some energy into that. And so I would I would really encourage you to take something of yourself into the jobs that you're going to have because you may not 
you may not be in a place that's going to be woke. Uh, you have to bring the woke to it. So that would be my advice to you. Be prepared to invest energy in your own perspective and advancing that in whatever place you end up. And before we close, I just want to say for those of you who were here two weeks ago at the Rappaport Center program, you learned that both CPCS, the Committee for Public Council Services, the public defenders in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the DA's offices, they hire lawyers right out of law school. And I can speak directly about CPCS and its chief counsel, Anthony Benedetti. There is great training that is going on in Massachusetts at CPCS. And many, many of the DA's offices, Glenn Kuna is here, he's at the Suffolk DA's office, are working. I can't say they're there. Perhaps not quite as woke as we wish, but they're working on being more informed. Okay, and with that, um, we're at time. I wanted to uh, thank all the panelists for their time and expertise. Uh, and to say, I'll the message, go be the change you want to see. Thank you. And